morning. There we go. Good morning. It is a beautiful morning to worship our King. Amen. We have uh, multiple songs this morning just uh, exalting his name, praising his, his name. And there's something that happens in a room of believers when we just exalt the name of Jesus. There's something that changes, that shifts, a mindset change, a heart change, and a heart posture. So we encourage you this morning as we worship just to exalt his name in the midst of trouble, in the midst of circumstances, in the midst of trials, or in the midst of good things that are going on in your lives. Worship him this morning in, in spirit and truth. And, uh, and, and just watch the, the mindset and the heart change as we lift our king. Amen? The splendor of the king Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide And trembles at its voice
Jesus, we are here, we're here for you. We've gathered in this place to honor you, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Oh, Jesus, we are here, we're here for you. for you. Oh, lift up your hands and let your praises rise. Open your hearts, loose the song inside. Oh, let us rejoice and let us magnify. Oh, Jesus, we are here, we're here for you. We're gathered in this place to honor you. To worship you in spirit and in truth. Oh, Jesus, we are here, we're here for you. For oh, break out in praise and let your shout around. For our God redeemed us with his mighty power. Oh, let's sing together, let us magnify his name. Oh, Jesus, we are here. We for you, we gathered in this place to honor you, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Oh, Jesus, we are here, we're here for you. Oh, break out in praise, let your shout arise. For our God redeemed us with his mighty power. Oh, let's sing together, let us magnify his name. Oh, break out in praise. Let your shout arise, for our God redeemed us with his mighty power. Oh, let's sing together, let us magnify his name. Oh, Jesus, we are here, we're here for you. Gathered in this place to honor you, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Oh, Jesus, we are here, we're here for you.
Close up the gates, fling wide the doors, the King of Glory's coming. Through city streets and living hearts, we see spirits moving. Now His kingdom comes, now His will be done. Lift up your banners and practice your praise. Fill up your mouths with that glorious name. And dance through the town Come celebrate Because heaven's come down Jesus Welcome King Jesus hey! We welcome King Jesus Bring all sick Call to the lost, tell them my God is with us. Come prophesy that now's the time. Get ready, church. Let's rise up. Now is kingdom come. Now is will be done. Lift up your banners and practice your prayer. Fill up your mouths with that glory. church we've come to lift his name today oh. we welcome the presence of jesus in this place where the spirit of the lord is there is healing there's deliverance in this place today Heaven's 
come down. Jesus, welcome King Jesus. Lift up your banners and practice your praise. Fill up your mouths with that glorious name. Jesus, warrior Jesus. Shout all ye people and dance through the town. Come celebrate because heaven's come down. Jesus, welcome King Jesus. Lift up your banners and practice your praise. Fill up your mouths with that glorious name. Jesus, warrior Jesus. Shout all ye people and dance through the town. Come celebrate because heaven's come down. Jesus, welcome King Jesus. give God praise. God is worthy. He is worthy. No one else is worthy, but He's worthy. Celebrating His praise, His goodness. We want to bless the Lord at all times. Amen. Aren't you glad that they said to you today, let's go to the house of the Lord? Didn't, aren't you glad that they said to you, let us go to the house of the Lord? Yeah. And we had that opportunity to gather together today to give him praise and glory and honor and thanks. Amen. Yeah. This morning we get to do something that we like to do around here because it's a sign that we're growing. This morning we have some folks that have been with us just for a little bit, but they've been through our classes and they have determined that they wanted to present themselves to take membership with Bethesda. Yeah. They've gone through the classes and heard what we're about and they're still here. Praise the Lord. I'm going to have them come in just a minute. But before I do that, I want to just encourage us, all of us. How many of you know all of us? Uh, a lot of times we make commitments to something, and as the years go by, we dwindle in our commitment. Hello? But we need to remind ourselves that we want to be covenant people. Covenant, not covenant breakers, but covenant people that are fast and hold fast to our word. Amen. That we are examples and follow through with what we make commitments to. This morning, they're going to be making a commitment to being a unifying church member. I want you to know it's sinful for people to go behind the scenes. And so discord. Even if you do it in the guise of Christianity. Even if you sprinkle enough Jesus dust on it to make it look right. Stirring up strife and causing issues and complaining and griping and bellyaching to the wrong people is wrong. Yes. Members of Bethesda commit themselves that they will be unifying church members. And that they will be people who bring people together, not separate. 
They're committing themselves to not letting their church be about their own preferences and their own desires. All of us have preferences. All of us have opinions. All of us have things that we would like to see maybe different. How many of you know it's not about my way or your way? We're doing our best as the leaders of this church to focus our attention on Jesus that we can do the best of our ability find out what is his best. Sometimes we're going to miss it. But we're trying to find out what is the right way. And it's not about what we want. Another thing they're committing to is I'll pray for my church leaders. I want you to know something. The elders of this church need your prayer. The people who are pastors in this church, they need your prayer, not your criticism. I, I think I ought to say that again. The leaders of this church need your prayer, not your criticism. And we want you to know as the elders of this church, nobody else governs this church but us. Did you hear me? No, we, we are the ones that are responsible. We, we take the brunt of it. Not somebody who sits in an office out on the campgrounds. The elders of this church, we govern this church. We've been put under this position in place. God ordained us to do it. And so we desperately need you to pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. They're committing to leading their family to be healthy church members. Do you know that we have individual responsibilities? We have individual responsibilities between us and God. Do you know that before, before there was a we, there was a me? Hello? Before there was a we, a, me, a we, there was a me. I had a personal relationship with Jesus before I ever came to the we. I need the we. But me and Jesus keep on going every single day of our lives. And I've got a, per, a personal accountability to him. And then thank God he gave me the one another's of the scripture. That we can operate together, to function together, to do what God wants us to do together. To sharpen our uh, our, ourselves to learn more to become more mature because we want to grow in the Lord right but it's my personal responsibility to take advantage of what's offered here at Bethesda Amen. you cannot grow sitting on the sidelines right. you cannot mature just because you showed up this morning right. we pat ourselves on the back Woo! I was there Sunday morning <laughs> but what else are you doing to see that you are transformed how many of you know we need to be being transformed That's right. yeah. by the renewing of our minds? And what is it that transforms us? It's the Word of God. Yes. It's our intimacy with Christ. I, I am sanctified by the truth. His Word is true. I have been washed by the washing of the water by the Word. Amen? Amen. I am transformed by that renewing of my mind so I can prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. That's my personal responsibility. Don't lose that. And then the last but not least, I will treasure my church membership. How many of you treasure the opportunity that we have to be a part of Bethesda? Yes. Some of you, I didn't see your hand go up. I will be talking to you afterwards. But this morning, the Williams family. Is going to come forward. They're going to come forward. I tell you what I like is when we do the class, we go through the class and and we share with them uh, right up front. Right up front. Don't be shy. Don't be backward. You don't have to go by age or height. <laughs> but I, I like in the classes that we do, I like the fact that when people are in that class and then they start saying to us, how can I get involved? Yes. Right. Huh? We don't want no spectators right. at Bethesda. We want people that are involved. And when they start, you don't even have to ask them, hey, what do you want to do to get involved? They start asking you, can I ask the girls, can I ask a, pa a question, Pastor Jerry? Uh, yeah, absolutely. How can we get involved in children's church? Woo. 
Do you guys have a drama team? I mean, I like to hear stuff like that, don't you? It shows that they're interested in doing something for the Lord. Tim and Janelle and um, Gabrielle and Trey, they came and present themselves this morning. Is that right? Did I say it right? Tria. Sorry. Present themselves this morning for membership at Bethesda because they feel like this is where God's planning them. Huh? They should not be up here this morning if they don't feel the Holy Spirit is planning them here. Did you know that? Because membership's a privilege, and so you should feel that God is bringing you to this place. Amen. Not that you're just doing it because it's the thing to do, or you feel like it's the thing to do, but because Holy Spirit is saying, here's where I want you to blossom. Here's where I want you to bloom. Here's where I want your talents and your gifts to be exercised. Here is where I want you to do the work that I have placed on you in your lives to help Bethesda extend their ministry, their vision, their direction to this city that we live in. And that's what they've committed to do. This morning, they're going to take a covenant that we have to where they are making a commitment not only to God, but to the church. And when they get done, when I get done reading this to them, their answer and response is going to be, by God's grace, we will. Because you can't do anything apart from the grace of God. Hello? Amen. You need the grace of God every day of your life to stay the course. And that's, what they're, that's how they're going to respond. And so I'm going to speak this to them, to each one of you, uh, together. And then you're going to respond at the end. By his grace, I will. Okay? Will you guys sincerely promise in the presence of God and these witnesses that you will believe in this Bible, believe and practice its teachings, Walk in the light of the New Testament as your faith, practice, and government. And be faithful as individuals to be transformed by the renewing of your minds and commitment to be a part of the ministries that are in Bethesda. Amen. By God's grace, I will. Let's stand and let's give them a, a hand clap. And when we, do, when we do meet and greet today, greet them and welcome them as members of Bethesda. Give our new members a round of applause one more time. What a blessing to add to the church and to add to the kingdom of God. Amen. At this time, we get to worship in a wonderful way of giving. Amen. 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 It was nice to have this new family in our giftings class, and, and uh, we are blessed to have them be a part of our church. They are very gifted and talented. Very interested in what we do, and I give God praise for that. And also, give caution that we need to put the enemy beneath our feet. Because he knows the growth that we face in our church. And he knows we're going to be adding the right tools and the right pieces to go forward. And so he's, he's, got, tax, he's got a tax plan, but we speak against it. We stand against it. We, we don't... We don't take hold of that. We're not scared of that. We rebuke it in the name of Jesus. So over this family, I, I speak life and health and prosperity over you guys because the enemy is going to try to attack, right? He's got plans, but God's kingdom's got bigger plans. And we know that he attacks our finances sometimes, and he tries to do things in ways to hold us back from giving to the kingdom of God. And we hear Pastor Doug every week come up here, and he'll give us scripture He'll encourage us to give, and I want to do that today. I want to encourage you guys. Over the last 
few months, I had a surgery take place. And I learned a long time ago from a pastor of mine that his first time he ever tithed and gave offerings was his unemployment check. His unemployment check was the first time he learned and discovered what tithing was. And since then, it's probably been 40 years that he continued to tithe and serve the Lord in that way. And uh, it was very encouraging. But I, I took that, and I'm, I'm going to confess to you that my walk with tithing was like this. I'd give and I'd take back and I'd give and I'd take back. And, and I want to challenge you today, if some of you are here today that you've done that, where you've given and you've taken back and you've given and you've taken back, I want to challenge you to commit to it and stay strong in giving to the Lord. Because the eight weeks that I was out of work where I had surgery, I had three checks come through. And I tithed those checks. I'm a tither. I love tithing. I love giving. I'm a cheerful giver. And the enemy was like, man, listen, this is what he does when it comes to giving. And outside of tithes, when it comes to giving to alms and offerings and those things, when it comes to giving Peru and Colombia and all these different places, he will sit there and tell you, don't do it. Don't do it. You need this money. You need it for this. You need it for that. You need it for groceries. You need it for this. I am telling you, when God calls you and tells you to give, to be obedient, don't question it. Don't process it because you will talk yourself out of it. Be faithful in your tithes and giving. And only, I only got three checks through that process, but God provided just what I needed. And it took discipline in other areas of my life to make it work. So me and God and my family had to work this out. And we still honored him and tithe through the process of not having what we normally have. And God blessed that. And I praise him for that. And I give him glory for that. And so for you guys, as we go to pay our tithes and we go to give our offerings, I challenge you. When the enemy comes knocking and says, You want to go out to eat Sunday, don't you? <laughs> no, I'm being serious because I have had this challenge. You want to be able to do this this week, don't you? Well, what about what about next week, maybe? Or what about this? He'll plant seeds that will take root if you give enough time for it to grow. So I'm going to pray. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to give because what you have given us what you have provided for us. You call us to give just 10%. You call us to give alms and offerings. Lord, we know that's not, that's not much to give at all. And we give you praise, God, and honor for providing the things that you provided for us, our finances and our families and our health. God, I pray right now that you bring increase to Bethesda and your kingdom, that the hearts of Bethesda are to give, not just a little, but an abundance, God. We give you praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. October 21st, the uh, young adult uh, chili cook-off will, uh, will be held at uh, Anthony and Heather Brown's house. Anthony is back there in the booth, and Heather is, yeah, she's over there. But anyway, um, so bring your hottest chili. Don't, you know, make sure it's hot because everybody around here likes something hot. So. Not everybody. Okay, not everybody. Oh, yeah. Richard doesn't like it. He, he likes to uh, add more sugar to his because he, he, he has a sweet tooth. Uh, October 21st, also the ICA uh, Walkathon. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, around Freeman Lake for five miles, and you can sponsor anybody you choose. It, it could be as, as simple as $1 or, you know, $100. Or $100. Yeah, if you got extra $100 laying around, sponsor somebody or break it up and sponsor, sponsor 10 different kids. It's, or 20. Or, yeah, that too. Um, All right, on October 23rd. Jerry do this. Oh, okay. All right. So Pastor Jerry, at the uh, last year at the Christmas party, you know he he was sitting around a table. I tell this story because it's just it was just one of those t times. Oh yeah, I will, I will. So we're all sitting around, you know, and we're all entertainment was going on. And Pastor Jerry he gets up and I don't know if he goes get a drink of water or whatever. I'm not sure what he did, but all of a sudden I look up and I see Pastor Jerry gone. I look up and I see. Elvis Presley on the second floor on the balcony. And I'm thinking, Pastor Jerry, is that you? It wasn't Pastor Jerry because he came back, but it was so funny. Everybody laughed. But, <laughs> but, uh, I'm kind of glad I wasn't here for that. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, well, this is important. This is important to announce, but it's, it's, it's important that you recognize uh, people when they, when they accomplish something. So here at the
God. Praise God. Amen. 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 You know, I'll tell you, we're starting out on a wrong note already. It never ceases to amaze me that we can sit in front of a, a TV screen on Saturday afternoon and write K or L for loser uh, or, or A or any of these other college football teams on your chest and you can jump up and you can shout touchdown and you can yell at the referee like he can hear you and all this other stuff. But when it comes to Sunday morning, we sit in our chair. Praise God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. So we're going to try this one more time. Praise God! Yeah. Man. Well, Pastor Jerry already said everything I was going to say today. I told Pastor Sean in the back of the church, I said, Pastor Jerry already preached today, so I, I think I'll just, uh, it's like we work for the same boss, right? <laughs> Leaves the 99 for the 1. Leaves the 99 for the 1. I remember being on recruiting duty in 2007. My assistant A gunner at the time, the guy that, that uh, worked with me, he was, he was my assistant, Alicio Huerta, if he's listening out there, just, I, I said his name today. We were sitting in my office, and we were, we were plugged with a mission, and we were missioned out that each one of my Marines had to find three individuals who met the mental and moral and physical qualifications in order to join the Marine Corps. So three each, and we had seven Marines in the office. It's a lot of people we had to find that month, a lot of work, a lot of prospecting, a lot of people we had to talk to. I used to tell them all the time, uh, Marines, hey, keep your heads held high. For every 99 people you, say, you ask if they're going to do it, one will say yes. And then he will be disqualified, and we'll have to go find 99 more. But it's okay, because we're going to find it. We're going to find a one. One particular morning, I just wasn't feeling it. I got out, and I, I did what I normally do. I came out, and I, I held, held high, uh, focusing on strength, because you can't show weakness in front of the people you're leading, right? But when I went back to my office, my assistant, Huerta, he knew something was up. And so he comes in, he closes the door, and he says, what's up, man? And I said, man, I'm just stressed. I'm overwhelmed. He said, you're losing the point. You're missing the point. He said, you're looking at the big number, but what you need to focus on is we're in the business of changing lives. We're in the business of changing lives. So when we go to that high school and we meet that kid who's wrapped up in this stuff or they're wrapped up in this stuff or whatever the case may be, we're going to grab that kid, we're going to talk to him, and we're going to tell him about how the Marine Corps changed our life, and it's all about that one. And once we get that one, we're going to get that two. And once we get that two, we're going to get that three. And by the time he was out of my office, once again, I, I was on cloud nine, because my vision had, 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 been clear, had been blurry, and he brought it back to me. And, and that's what we need in life. Sometimes our vision gets a little cloudy, and we really, we really forget what our true purpose is, what we're, what we're doing, what, what we're supposed to do. So today is October 15th, and Jesus is coming back for the bride that has made themselves ready. And we're going to hear that. But it's going to be a whole lot louder. And it's going to shake your spirit inside. Yes. And whether you believe or you don't believe, on that particular day, you're going to believe. Yes. Doesn't matter what I say. A.W. Tozer, I've been reading his book lately, right? A.W. Tozer said, if I have to argue you in the kingdom, that means somebody can argue you out of the kingdom. Yes. And I'm not here to argue into the kingdom. I'm here to tell you this. I was once this way, and now I'm another. He called my name. Yes. I was just like this, but now I came out like this. Sometimes I look around and I look at my wife and I said, if these people only knew who I was before God came into my life. It's like eating bologna and all of a sudden he gave you steak. You don't ever want to go back. You don't want to go back to that life. So the question today is, is, is the same question I've asked people for many, many years. However, in my former life as a Marine, it was a little bit different. It was a little bit different. And the question today is, are you ready? Are you truly ready? Are you a force of readiness, or are you still playing with the selfie role? So are you ready? Are you ready for Jesus to return? 
Are you ready to draw your last breath? Several years ago, Jessica and I received a phone call. I was in a hotel in Lexington, Kentucky. It was about 11.30, 11.45 at night. My best friend in the world, Chris, called me, which is Jessica's cousin, and he said, hey, man, he said, Tim just passed away. Tim was his brother. He was 38 years old. And when you hear about a loved one passing away, the first thing you want to say is, well, how'd that happen? How is that possible? I just saw him. And that's, a, that's how, we, that's how we, uh, uh, we handle that in our human mind. We don't understand that yet. It takes us a while to process that, that he's not here anymore. He's not physically here anymore. So Tim, let me tell you about Tim. Uh, we, I used to make fun of him all the time when he was a kid. And I used to chase him down in the mall and he'd run from us. We had all kinds of stories. And every time we go home, his daughter, Olivia, always says, tell me stories about my dad. All right, which one you want to hear? There's, there's tons of them. So I just went and saw him. We just went to Tennessee and saw him. And in August, two weeks later, he died right after his birthday. He was sitting on the couch at his home. His wife called him. She said, hey, what do you want for dinner? And, and I guess he, applied, he, he replied. But by the time she got home, Tim had passed away. It was a blood clot that had been working for years and years and years. And he had passed away. So I say that because a lot of people say, well, uh, I don't know when the end of the age is coming. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter when Jesus is coming back. We've got to play like he's coming back right now. Or you've got you to remember that I could drop dead in the next five seconds. So whether I'm ready, prepared for the end of the age, or whether I'm prepared for the right here, that's what's important. Am I ready? Amen. Am I ready? So what's standing between you and God? So Jessica and I get, a, get an opportunity to travel uh, sometimes, and we, we just got back from Cleveland, Tennessee, where I, where I grew up at, uh, and we went to Peerless Road Church of God, where, where our family goes to church, and uh, there was the pastor up there right now, they're going through intern pastor, so they have four different people preaching, so that particular Sunday was William Lamb, you guys probably know him, he came up, uh, me and him fist, fist bumped, said Semper Fi, because we're both Marines, and, you know, and, and I really love the way he is, because he's like real aggressive when he speaks, I'm like, yeah, I can recognize that, yeah. But he talks about this. He said, he talk, his whole thing was, uh, was talking about, are you ready? And it just kind of hit me, because this is the whole thing that the Lord's been talking to me about for some time now. Are you ready? So what he had us do is we had us go to somebody, and he had us grab them by their hands, just like this, stand them up, look them right in the hairy eyeball, right? Because it, it does something when you look another man in the eyeball, don't it? And ask them, are you ready for the kingdom of God to come? And then he, then he looked at us and he said, and then he started talking about some other things. And then he said, go to that, and, and, and the person next to me was a, was a family member. So I looked at him and I asked him, and, I, and at first I kind of went through the motion, Stephen. Because how many times have we been asked that question? So I, so I grabbed her, I pulled her in, and I smiled at her, and I said, sweetie, are you ready for the kingdom of heaven to come? Are you ready? And she goes, yes, I'm ready. I said, Sweet. So then William starts uh, preaching a little bit more. He starts delivering the word a little bit more. And he says, that's it. Grab him again. Grab him in again. And pull him close. So I pulled her in real close. And I said, sweetie, are you ready? You know what she said? I'm not sure. So I start to cry. It's just the way it is. She said, I'm not sure. She started looking at me, and immediately I said, praise God. Because this little, little lady, she was just on the choir. She was just singing. She's involved every Wednesday. She goes all this stuff. But that meant nothing. That means nothing. You could be doing all the work you can. You could be out at every ministry there is. You could be running here, running there, you know, all over the place. But the, the point of the matter is, is do you truly know? So immediately I looked at Jessica and I said, sweetie, come over here and let's pray. So Jessica began to minister to her, talking to her. And then at the end of it, Meg, she said, I'm ready. So what, what had to happen in order for that to take place was she had to stop worrying about what she thought or what he thought or what she thought. 
Just because you've sat on this pew for 85 years, or just because your daddy's brothers, uncles, nephews, cousins, uh, sisters, nephews, I don't know, was a Sunday school teacher, doesn't mean that you're ready. Just because you've been to every theological theologian school and you have a master's doctors and you have a doctor degree in divinity doesn't mean you're ready those diplomas that, that I have gotten doesn't mean anything what means is every single day am I laying myself down and I would love to tell you that answer is yes but it's not so the, the question comes back to me all the time are you ready when I get up here to speak what's the first thing the enemy tells me who are you? Who are you to get up here and say all this stuff because you struggle too? And sometimes does he get me? Yeah, he does. But I look right back at him, not by my strength, but by the strength of the Holy Spirit, by the strength of Christ Jesus, by the strength of my Father. And I look right back at him and I say, I'm a child of God. Amen. That's who I am. You don't qualify me. He qualifies me. You don't know my name. He knows my name. I'm not your son. You can't reproduce. Amen. He is my father. Amen. So we need to stop worrying about what people think. And we need to get real. If you're not noticing what's going on in the news right now, it's a pretty big deal. Israel declared war. Israel declared war. I want that to sink into you. I want that to sink into your soul. I want you to understand what's going on right now because we're at a war and the enemy's coming up on his last, last little advancement. And guess what he's going to do? He's going to fight with tooth and nail on that last little advancement. He's going to give everything he's got. He's going to throw everything he can at you. But as long as we're sanctified and justified, yes. we're going to persevere. But it's about every single, every single day laying yourself down. God commands us to obey just as a loving father asks us to obey because he knows what's good for us. I don't know what's good for me. I do not know what's good for me, but he does. Right. He knows what's good for me. Leviticus 18.30 says, keep my requirements and do not follow any distasteful customs that were practiced before you came. Do not defile yourselves with them. I am the Lord your God. There will be no time to get ready. Some people think that. Some people think, well, you know what? In the, in the last couple minutes before I die, I'll just say, I believe you, Lord. You might not have time. Some people look at my life and they say, well, you had a chance. That was God's plan. God's plan, that's how my life uh, advanced, but that's not, that's not maybe the plan he has for you. So if you know what's good and, you, and he's showing you a better life, why would you not choose that? Why would you continue to plan things? Yeah. So you won't have time to get ready. You need to what? Be ready. And then you need to be ready for those around you. Last night I told my wife, I said, I said we need to walk around our neighborhood right now. Grab the dogs and let's go. I said, we're going to go pray for every single house out here. Because I do not want to be standing in line at the great white throne and have somebody sit there and look at me and go, hey, that's Fred Jones. Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me, Brad? Why didn't you tell me, Kayla? Miss Laura? I don't want that. I want them to say, that man nags me every time he sees me. He talks about Christ. He talks about the Lord coming. He talks about his goodness. He don't even care who I am. He don't even know my name. But he talks to me every single day. That's fine. I would rather be known for that, wouldn't you? Amen. 2 Peter 3.10 says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Like a what? Thief. Like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid before them. The time is coming, Ricky, to get our houses in order. We spoke about that a couple Sundays ago, didn't we, brother? Yeah. It's time to get your house in order. Isaiah 38, Hezekiah is ill. And the prophet comes to him and he says, this is what the Lord says. Put your house in order because you are going to what? Die. 
you will not recover. Put your house in order. It's time to put our houses in order. It's time to stop living in both worlds. Or as my, my sister says, you got to stop being a Facebook mom and be a real mom today. Right. you got to be, stop being a Facebook Christian, a Twitter Christian, and all these other things and say glory to God. And then you go out and do something else, and you got to be real. you got to start moving forward. Yeah. you got to start claiming who you really are. Change your behavior or change your name. Amen. Change your behavior or change your name. When I was a little boy, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, you probably do, my, my father was a police chief, right, he was a cop, and uh, just like any little boy, you look up to your daddy when he puts his uniform on, his badge, his gun, and uh, you know, my mom and dad worked two jobs, <clears throat> so sometimes I had to go be like Andy and Opie, and I had to go hang around the jail, right? So they had this old jail in the back where they kept the police cars, and then there's this old jail out there. And it wasn't like the jails you see now, like Richard had, you know, like the, the sliding jails. It was those old hinge jails, you know, the hinge. And my dad knew that as soon as he went into his office and started doing his thing, that little Junior here would sneak off, right? And I'd go get my dad's nightstick, and I'd be like, oh, you know, I'm a cop, you know? And I'd go sit in his car in the, in the garage, and, you know, maybe I'd put his hat on. And then sometimes I'd venture into the jails, and they didn't have prisoners in those jails anymore. Those jails were abandoned. But, you know, they had supplies and stuff in there. And I'd go play around in the jail cell for a little while. And my dad, he, he, would, he would look at me. Boy, you been back there in them jails? What would I do? No, sir. <laughs> hey, first of all, don't lie to a cop. It's just not good. Right? They figure it out. They really do. They're, it's almost like they're trained for it. Just saying. So he would tell me, he'd say, son, son. Stop playing in those jail cells. That door's going to close on you one day, and I'm not going to see you. And then you're going to be stuck all by yourself back there. Son, son, please, stop playing in those jail cells. You're going to get hurt, and I'm not going to be there for you. Son, quit playing in them. Did I listen? No, six years old, seven years old, I go into the jail cell. And when I went in, I kicked that door, because I thought I was some kind of ninja, right? I kicked that door, and when I walked in that door, Richard, all of a sudden I heard that slam! And it was the most eerie feeling in the world at that age, because I knew my dad couldn't help me. He couldn't help me. I screamed, I yelled, but if you were back there in his police department, you couldn't hear from his office. Luckily, one of his patrolmen came in and started laughing at me and came back there and he said he unlocked the door. And as soon as he unlocked the door, what did I do? I ran to my father. Did he, did he scold me? My dad wasn't that kind of man. Snatched me up, pulled me in, and he said, Now do you know why I want you to stop playing in those jails? Well, one day, how's it going to sound when you continuously play in this jail cell and all of a sudden you're still not getting your house in order and that door slams behind you? For good. No one can come get you out. Daddy can't come get you. No one can. It's gone. You're in there. It's closed. Forever. You can't be mad at God because his whole, your whole life, he said to you what? Son, daughter, quit playing in those old jail cells. One day that door is going to close. One day that door is going to close. So we got to stop. We have got to stop playing in these make-believe jail cells. We got to stop playing. Change your name or change your behavior. Why is hell so often? Well, one, it was, created for Satan, uh, it was created for Satan and his demons. It wasn't created for you. Look to your neighbor and say, it wasn't created for you. Now say it with some passion. It wasn't created for you. Because people don't realize that hell is the absence of who? God. There is no air in hell because God's breath of life is what? Gone. There is no peace because God is the prince of what? Peace. There is no comfort in hell because God is the comforter. There is no love in hell because God is what? 
Hell is darkness because God is light. And you don't have to go there. But the only way to escape is through salvation in the name of Christ Jesus. That's the only way. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. It doesn't say, in order to go to heaven, you got to do it Fred's way. You know, this morning I got up and I read a little bit of The Pilgrim's Promise. If you've ever not read that book, I highly suggest you do. And it was talking about these two other pilgrims that were on the path with him. And he was headed down this path. But anytime these other pilgrims saw this big steep hill and all this stuff that they were about to come through, what did they start doing? They started looking for an easier path. The problem was is when they started looking at those easier paths, they ran into destruction and they ran into death. But the Lord says we're not supposed to persevere in these trials, right? Because per- perseverance comes our strength in him. So in first church this week, first of all, it's always good to have a pastor, right? And I got two awesome pastors, Pastor Laura, Pastor Patty. What just awesome women of God. And then I have uh, Pastor Denise in there that's laying the word on me, slapping me every minute, right? Where's Renata? Yep. Let's see, who else is in there? Uh, oh, Sylvia er, and uh, Gina. And then there's only three of us guys in there. We're outnumbered, right? Uh, Andrew, and Andrew's there. I just kind of look at him across the table like, oh, man, we're about to get whooped, right? And then there's John. Uh, he, he's there with us as well. But in, in first church this week, it was kind of a wake-up call, wasn't it, Pastor Laura? We were sitting at the kitchen table, and it was me and, and Miss Denise and Miss Laura. We are sitting there, and we're, just, we're talking about the Lord coming back, and we're talking about all these great things, and how people need to get what? Get serious and get, get on the right track. And all of a sudden, man, you would think about this alarm went off. I had no idea there was a school behind us, right? <laughs> this alarm went off, and, and Miss Laura's kitchen window was right up next to that elementary school, and it was, woo! And I mean, I tell you, I jumped. And I'm looking up. Let's do this! I'm tired of being here, right? But you talk about, man, are you ready? Because that's how quick it's going to happen. We're sitting at the kitchen table just talking about, you know, the Lord. And all of a sudden, here he comes. Just that quick. So a question was brought up in First Church this week. What's the scripture? Anybody know? No, you're you're a week behind. Matthew 16 and 18, right? And it says, I also say to you, uh, that you are Peter, and upon this, rock, uh, upon this rock, what rock? Christ Jesus, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower it. That's the memory scripture, right? The gates of hell will not overpower it. The gates of hell will not prevail. So then the question was, is where is the gates of hell prevailing in our community? Where are they prevailing in our community? First thing that came to my mind, where the gates of hell are prevailing, where we are failing. We're failing as a church. The question was asked to me one time, they said, why is the world so confused? Because they're looking at us! And they're confused. They're confused. There's 110 churches in Hardin County, Kentucky. Do you guys know that? According to Google. Google never lies, right? So if Google says 110, I'm willing to bet there's probably 160. Because everywhere I go, there's a, there's a church everywhere. I mean, if, if you say you can't go to church on Sunday... It's because you didn't leave the house. You know, there's somewhere to go. I'll tell you. A lady asked me the other day, she said, what denomination are you? I said, uh, the way. You know? She said, well, I might show up. And I said, well, hey, worst case scenario, you show up, you don't like it, you leave. You know? That's it. But I guarantee you when you come, guess what? The Holy Spirit's going to grab you. If you don't, then we need to put some pedals on you. You know? So 110, 140 churches in Hardin County, and when we voted to stop abortion, 60 to 70 percent of Hardin County voted against it. Hmm. So we have all these churches, big mega churches too, right? We have huge churches, right? And I'm not just saying them. There's us in here too, right? We can do just about as much work as anybody else, right? So 60 to 70 percent of Hardin County chose not uh, chose to say no. Uh, we want abortion. Think about that. When you drive around, you're seeing all these signs for governor. 
Instead of looking at the sign, looking at your wallet, look at what they stand for. You know, all I hear is raise this, money this, more this, more that. This guy does this and this guy does that. Listen, Pastor Jerry said it a long time ago. Go into that booth and ask the Holy Spirit to convict you to vote for. Who do you want me to vote for, Lord? Not how much money am I going to make. Not how much raises I'm going to make. Oh, but Pastor Fred, you have a guaranteed retirement. <laughs> do we, Andrew? Do we, Dale? This government falls tomorrow. That's gone. All gone. And it doesn't matter how many years of service we did. They'll drop us like a bad habit without even thinking about it. So don't think I'm sitting in my house depending on that. We're shooting at our own ship. We as Christians are shooting at our own ship. There's conservative Christians. There's radical Christians. There's gypsy Christians. Christians. There's this. There's that. We used to have, uh, how many denominations did we have, Richard? You told me one time. Do you remember? I know you're getting old. 144,000. 144,000 different denominations came out of the way. In the book of Acts, when it says, where are we? We're called the, the way, because we're what? We're following the way, the truth, and the life. And out of that, 144,000 denominations, that's not good enough for the enemy. Now he's going to say, well, all you, all you other ones, we'll just say radical Christians, conservative Christians. Some say this and some say that. But no one wants to, they don't want to look at the word and rightly divide the word of truth. They want to call it a hate speech. You know, this week I, I came across a, a young lady. She told me, she said, I'm leaving my church. I said, I'm glad you're here because <laughs> I'm looking for a new church. My question is, why are you leaving your other one? Because I don't support that. Why are you leaving the other church? Well, my pastor, he talks about this, and he talks about homosexuality, and he talks about all this, and he talks about that's an abomination, and blah, 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 blah. You might not want to come here, right? Kind of like we had a certain couple show up to church one time, and they said, well, we're, at, we're not, not, not sure about all the worship that takes place. And I said, well, praise God, I'm glad you're here. And then I walked over to Brad, and I said, I don't know if they're going to like it here. Because if Michaela starts going like this. <laughs> and then you get one of those old uh, pastors up there, like Pastor Jerry. And I don't talk that long, but he does. <clears throat> we could be here a while, right? But the problem is, is we got too much self going on and not enough truth. Amen. So to be ready, needs, I need to eliminate the I. I need to eliminate the I or the me or the self and lean on Christ. Study the word, look to the truth. Walk out of the prison that has no door. Has no door. Stop being concerned about what people think. Yes. Yes. You know, when I'm sitting here at this pew, right, or pew, sorry. I, I'm back, this one lady told me this week they had this thing called packing a pew, and it's been in my mind here lately. But this chair, and the Lord says, go fall on your face. I shouldn't be worried about Somebody in the back singing, well, why is Pastor Fred going and falling on his face? What's he repenting for? Everything! You know, the Lord tells me to repent, live a life of repentance. And when he says fall on your face, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I think I've done something or not done something. He says, go fall on your face. Go fall on your face. We need to be obedient and do these things. So we need to stop being concerned about what people think about us and start being more concerned where we are in the kingdom. That's right. See, when we stop focusing on what other people think about us, we have a tendency to grow. Yeah. Grow. Yeah. When we stop believing the lies of the enemy, then we have a tendency to grow. Christ says to lay, lay ourselves down as a living sacrifice. It's not about me. It's not about what I can accomplish. It's not about what I can do or what I can get away with because sometimes we think that, don't we? What can I get away with? Now, here's what the book says. Mm, let me go play in the gray a little bit. Well, when I play in the gray, I go play in those jail cells. It's not about looking at me and seeing what I've done. It's about dying to self and moving forward in Christ, eliminating the eye. Uh, we continue to live with one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. We damage those around us. 
We damage those around us. By what? By living two different lives. They confuse. I will not stop until we fully submit. Say to your neighbor, it's time to get serious. Sarita, really look at him and say it's time to get serious because he needs to hear this. All right? Anytime I get a chance to come up here and talk to the one who discipled you, it's always nice, right? 1 John 5.21, it says, Dear children, keep away from anything that may take, may take God's place in your heart. Did he say stay away from alcohol? Did he say stay away from this or stay away from that? Did he name something specific? No, he said what? Anything. Stay away from anything that comes between me and you. So people walk up to me and they say, well, is that a sin? I don't know. <laughs> if you got to ask me if it's sin, guess what? Probably is. All right? Just like, you know, people ask me, is it a sin for chewing? The Lord told me it's a sin for me. The Lord told me specifically, you need to stop chewing. Stop. So for me to keep going, what does that mean? It's a sin. So we need to eliminate the eye. You know, sometimes I still have PTSD from boot camp. I lie in the bed at night and I think the drill instructor's yelling at me. But the one thing that they did was, is they brainwashed us. You guys know that, right? Every Marine's in a cult, right? We're on our own organization, right? We think we're bulletproof, because we are. We're not allowed to die until drill instructor staff are lynched, tells me I'm allowed to, right? That's the things they told me. But they also told me this, they eliminated the I. Did you know for 13 weeks I was not allowed to say I? I couldn't say it. I need a pencil. I need to use the bathroom. I need to use this. Anytime I came out of your mouth, there was some pain that came to your mouth. And you can fill in the blanks on how that worked, all right? If you don't believe me, I got a couple people here that went to the same place I did. Well, I went to the real place. You went to the, the Paris Island place, right? But anyway. Oh, you, oh, we're both Hollywood. All right, I love you then. All right. <laughs> but we had to learn at an early age that the name on the left, which said U.S. Marines, us Marines, was way more important than the name on the right, which said Jones, Smith, whatever. And I still remember uh, this recruit, because that's what you were called. You were called a recruit. You couldn't call a private. You wouldn't call private first class. You had no rank. They didn't call you dude. They called you all kinds of things. But the biggest thing they called you was recruit. They wanted to make sure that you understood that you were not a part of this organization. And this one, this one guy, he couldn't, he couldn't get it right. He kept saying, I, I need to use the head, which is the bathroom. By the way, for all you guys who go on an army base, if you really want to make them mad, just use a bunch of naval terminology, and it really just blows their mind. So he's sitting on the quarter deck. The quarter deck is like the, the welcoming area of a ship, and that's what we call the, when you walk into a, a, a squad bay, we call that the quarter deck. And he's sitting on, the, sitting on the, uh, the quarter deck there. And when you come in and you hear a bunch of yelling, you've got to prepare yourself, don't you, Richard? You're like, man, I don't know what's going on in there. Oh, Lord. Just help me get through it, right? So this kid's yelling, I, this recruit, I, this recruit. And he did that for 25 minutes. 25 minutes. Because the drill instructor wanted him to understand what? That there is no I. There is no I. See, you had to learn how to depend on one another as a team. You had to learn to lean on one another as a team. We, had a, we, had, we have a motto. It's called Semper Fidelis. We walk by each other and we say, hey, Semper Fi, Marine, which means always faithful. I was walking through Gatlinburg and I saw this guy and he had, he had this uh, Marine Corps shirt on. And, of course, I had my hat on. And we both had long hair and beards and looked like we were a bunch of hippies. But at one point we had uh, close haircuts and we all looked good, right? And I walked by him and I said, hey, Semper Fi. And without even thinking about it, he, went, he, he embraced me and hugged me. And he said, Semper Fi, brother, when did you serve? Blah, 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 blah. And we didn't know each other. Never met in our lives. And we sat there and talked for like 15, 20 minutes. My wife's like, still amazed. But it's a bond, right? So we used to walk by each other and we'd say, Super Fi. But we used to also say something to you if you were stepping outside your, your uh, uh, the, you were stepping back into self instead of the team. We'd walk by you and say, hey, Semper I, right? Take care of yourself. Always faithful to yourself, huh? And as soon as you heard that, it kind of woke you up a little bit about where you are. So my question today is, is where are you? Is the name on the left 
that says believer and follower of the Lord Jesus Christ more important than your last name? Or is it the other way around? Change your name or change your behavior? We've been on that slide for a while. Next slide. Don't worry, I only got 55 slides. <clears throat> so we live in a world that promotes themselves. We watch sports where athletes come out and beat their chest and they scream, oh, it's all about me, I did it, right? Like uh, you'll, walk, you'll walk through and you'll see uh, uh, this one particular uh, player that used to play for that other team in Alabama that I don't ever say their name, but they, you know, he comes out and he rips his shirt like this, boom! I'm Superman, I scored in the end zone. But what he failed to recognize was the other 11 guys that was down on the field helping him block. So they come in the end zone, they spike the ball, and they throw it around like they never, like, they, like that was their first time ever in there. You know, they, they, don't, they don't turn around and completely acknowledge their team. Not all of them. Some of them do. But for the most part, our kids are watching that too. And what are they doing? They're starting to emulate those guys. They're starting to be like those. I want to be like that. I want to be number one. I want to be this. I want to be that. I want to be the best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be, right? And then we watch reality TV. Back in the day, it used to call soap operas, right? Now it's called reality TV, where there's nothing but betrayal, self-preservation. The only way to get ahead is to trample the person in front of you. I remember running one time. Uh, we used to train people to get ready for different physical fitness events that they were going to uh, uh, come across in the Marine Corps, whether it be on the officer side or the enlisted side. And I remember people tasking me out to go run with these people because at one point I, I was kind of fast. So I was running behind this guy, and he, they told me, they said, hey, this guy quits a lot. And I said, all right, well, I'll get him not to quit. So I run, I'm running behind him. And every time he starts to slow down, I step on his heel. I, I reach out and step on his heel. And I tell him, I said, young man, you slow down one more time. I said, my foot's going to be on the back of your calf. The next one's going to be on the small of your back. And the other one's going to be on the back of your head. I'm going to run over you. He didn't slow down anymore. But unfortunately, that's how the world tells me a lot, too. Just slow down. And the world's always looking for a prodigal. They're always looking for you to cash in on what you believe and come on their side. And they're more welcome to welcome you back. This is how the world views the success. This is how it trains you to become. You're taught that you can compromise your values as long as it brings more power and more financial gain. And it makes sense. Hey, don't tell them what that, that thing's really worth because you'll have to do this. Hey, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't do this. Listen, you don't have to tithe. Hey, you tithe this week, Isaiah. You don't need an offering. And then in your mind, you start to go, well, that makes sense. Because when we talk about what we're supposed to be doing as Christians, guess what it doesn't make sense to? The world. It doesn't make sense when we go do our taxes and we, we turn in all this stuff. It doesn't make sense to them. Why would you do that? Why would you do all that? They don't understand. They like to promote self over the others. And, and when we do that, we continue down this slippery slope full of destruction led by pride Entitlement and lust. Go ahead. Man, he's getting good. <laughs> pride, entitlement, and lust. What's pride? Pride's look at me. Look at me shine. Woo! Look at me, look at me. Hey, 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 Lord, don't put me over here where I'm uncomfortable. Hey, put me here so I can shine. Right? In the Marine Corps, we used to call those hot house flowers. They had conditions in order for them to perform. See, God doesn't need your strength. In your weakness, that's where he's going to prevail. So why are we still looking at me? Entitlement. I've worked hard and I deserve this. My favorite Pastor Jerry stories are when he used to work for the phone company. It was the phone company, right? And he would make all this money because he was 18 years old or 17 years old, and he'd make all this money. And, and, and if I was that age making that money, I'd be like, woo and then he would talk about how he deserved this on the weekends, right? And, and you guys can fill in the blanks, but it was probably filled with standing in front of the porcelain God there, you know, praying and telling the Lord that you will never do that again, only to be there next weekend in the same place at the same time doing the very same thing. Because we feel like we're what? We're entitled to that. I've worked hard for that. I've worked these many hours at work. I deserve that. And all that's going to get us in is, is a life of destruction. And the enemy sits back and he goes, yes, son, you deserve that. You're entitled to that. Keep moving forward. 
And then lust. I know I have a new car, but man, look what Steven's driving. Man, I got this, I got this new camper, but man, Pastor Doug Spanhauer, look at his camper. You know, I, I love this story that Pastor Doug told about his uh, future uh, father-in-law, John, at the wedding. And uh, I haven't forgot that story because he said he shows up to John's house. You guys all know John. John, wave your head. John, John tells me, he says, uh, one time I was talking about all the whoopings I got. And he said, did you ever get a whooping you didn't deserve? No, I deserved every single one of them. Probably a few more, right? But Pastor Doug was talking about John and how he went to go visit John one day. And, and when he came to his house, John has his smoking, uh, looking uh, awesome Corvette sitting in the driveway. Just, you can tell he, he's polished it up and he's waxed it and he just... Man, it's awesome, right? The only thing that would look better is when Sylvia gets in that thing and it, may, it completes it, right? <laughs> completes that bit. But, you know, here's John, and, and Doug walks up, and he's thinking that John, uh, John's going to pull him over and start talking about what? Man, this, guy's got, this thing's got a 350 with a 400 turbo transmission with 396 heads in it and blah, blah, this, and 60. I don't even know what I'm talking about. But he's got all kinds of other stuff in it. Man, it's fast. But John went right by that Corvette, walked inside the house, and showed Pastor Doug his family, all the pictures on the wall. See, I'm not telling you you can't have things in this world, but when we start lusting after them, that's a different ball game. When we start putting that Corvette in front of God, we're going to fail every single time. Because he tells us in his word not to have anything to do with anything that's going to come between you and I. Anything. I love Chancel. What a great kid. This all should change when we come to Christ. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified in Christ. It's no longer I live, but who? Christ lives in me. And I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in who? Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So then in Romans 12.1, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because all he has done for you, let him be the living and holy sacrifice, the kind that find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. And then the last one in 1 Corinthians 6.20, you were bought with a price. Look to your neighbor and say, you're special, you were bought with a price. Now, sometimes when you say you were bought with a price, I don't think we understand what price was paid. You know, I was thinking about that, this, uh, just so you guys don't know that uh, none of my neighborhood goes to this church, but they've heard this sermon seven times this week, <laughs> right? Because when I, when I start to look and practice, I get a little loud, not just here, but at my house as well, right? And I'm sure my neighbors are like, there's that dude, he's so crazy, man. I think that Marine has done lost his mind, right? And you're right, I have lost my mind. I've taken on the mind of Christ Jesus, Amen. right? So that's okay to lose your mind, right? But you were bought with a price. I think about that scripture where it talks about a friend laying down his life uh, life for another friend. And that got me thinking about those people who gave their lives in the military. See, sometimes we can't imagine Christ going to that cross. And we can't imagine him hanging up there because we weren't physically there. So sometimes we overlook that. But then when I go to uh, military cemeteries... And I look down, and I see that white rock, and I see gunnery sergeant so-and-so, staff sergeant so-and-so, United States Marine Corps, and I think about what they did. Or Corporal Jason Dunham, who gave his life to his fellow Marines by jumping on a, a hand grenade in 2004 at a checkpoint in Iraq. And when I think about that, it makes me cry. Because I know what they did for us. That's selfishness. That's putting everything out there. And he did that for you, Tim, before you were even born. He went to that cross and he said, you know what, my knucklehead son Fred, he's a knucklehead, but I'm going to do this for him. I'm going to lay this down for him so he doesn't have to. I'm going to do this so on the Day of Atonement, he doesn't have to bring sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice because I'm going to go to that cross and I'm going to lay myself down one time for him. And all he has to do is keep his eyes on me and continuously lay that down. 
and lay that down and eliminate your, the I in you, eliminate the self. <clears throat> so Zach and I discussed these scriptures one day, and, and I was, uh, Zach, you know, I, I love talking to, to my sons, uh, and Zachary, uh, he's kind of blunt like his daddy is. Uh, Dakota is too, he's just more quiet about it. Uh, but Zach says, Dad, if we're supposed to be the living sacrifice, then how come when we lay something down at the altar, we walk away and we look back only to go back and what? Pick it back up again. <laughs> you talk about getting some truth from your kid. I love it when my boys challenge me. And I told them, I said, the same reason we fail. At some point, we forget what God has done for us. And we start to believe in our own self being a God. Yeah. We start believing that all we needed is a Savior and we don't need a shepherd. Okay, God, I got it. Jesus, you went on a cross and you died for me. But I'm going to walk this out on my own. Because I got this. Next slide. We start believing these bumper stickers and t-shirts. God is my co-pilot. God doesn't need me to help him fly a plane. God doesn't need me to help him fly anything. He loves me and includes me, but he doesn't need me to fly uh, the plane. I need Jesus and whiskey. Does that make any sense? God loves me so much that he made Jim Beam. What? All I need is a little bit of coffee and a whole lot of Jesus. Is that true? All I need is a little bit of wine and et cetera and et cetera. Why do I need a substance from this world in Jesus? Amen. I need to keep my eyes on yes. Jesus. When I get up in the morning, I want coffee. I don't need coffee. If you don't know me enough, I shouldn't drink coffee after 5 o'clock in the afternoon, right? Because I'm already hyped up. I don't need those things. I want those things. Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, and he says in John 14, uh, 4, 13 through 14, he says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Talking about the well. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never be thirsty. The water I give becomes a spring of water gushing up inside of them. That person giving eternal life. So here's what I see. We don't want to drink the water because that would consume us. And if we're consumed by Christ Jesus, if we truly lay ourselves down, then, then Caden, that means we're going to have to lay a few things down, brother. That means I might not get to hang out with those friends that I once had, Michaela. That means I might not have to, I can't do that stuff anymore. Maybe I can't drink anymore. Oh, wow, what a sacrifice. Well, see, we see that as a sacrifice, but when I look to the cross, that's, that's nothing. That's nothing. So until we get serious and start really thinking about and examining ourselves, we look over that sometimes when David says, examine me, O Lord. That scares me to death when I say that. Because I'm asking the God Almighty, God who created everything in the universe, to look inside of me and examine me. We may lose friends. So all we really want to do is we just want to rinse a little around in our mouth and spit it out. Just enough to feel good. I don't want to be transformed. I just want to feel good. And then I'll go through the world and I'll hang out with the world and I'll do all those things. And then I'll come back Sunday and I'll ask Pastor, Pastor, lay your hands on me and pray for me because I'm struggling. You're struggling because you're disobedient. The same thing that when I'm disobedient, guess what? I start to struggle. So don't pray that everything's going to get better. Pray that I what? That I start listening to my father. You know, it was pretty simple in my household. If you did what my dad told you, no one got whooped. It's pretty simple, you know. Dad just didn't come in and be like, all right, so who am I going to whoop today? Come here, boy. <laughs> you look pretty good. Let's start with you. If he did that, he'd have been right on target, though, because, I mean, you know, I was usually the one, me, right? But if we're, if we're obeying our parents or if we're obeying our father, guess what? It's pretty simple. My dad used to tell me all the time, it's easy to do the right thing because you don't even have to think about it. And I used to think about that. What are you talking about? But he's right. 
Because when I would do things wrong, how much more would I have to think about it in order to cover it up? Okay, when I get home, let me run through this. Okay, all right. Okay, he might go for that. All right, let me do that. In my 15-year-old mind, <laughs> I thought that my 45-year-old father would fall for that. That's funny now, but back then it was like, yeah, I got this. Yeah, he's dumb. He's stupid. I got this. Yeah. He's from Kentucky. <laughs> Listen, I don't want to be just feel good. I want to be transformed. When I go places, I want people to say, here he comes again, and he's going to talk about Christ. Here he comes again. And he's going to say this. Here he comes in and he's going to ask me if I'm ready. That he asks me every single time. Because sometimes we've got to be asked twice. Sometimes you can sit there in your chair and you can be thinking, oh, I'm, I'm good. I'm great. Me and Jesus has got this thing on lockdown. But then that second time comes to you and you look somebody at the hairy eyeball, right? And they stare right down into you where you can't lie, you can't run, you can't go left and right. Because anytime my father locked eyes on me, I knew I was in, <laughs> I couldn't go anywhere. And then I have to be real with myself. And I have to answer that question. Is my house in order? We must focus on uh, first Jesus, and then all things will fall into place. If we have Jesus, God will send others in our life. If we seek Jesus, God will bless us. And the Holy Spirit will guide us to where we need to go. He will equip us for every good work and every fight. Discernment. He will give us discernment. And today, I won't say more than ever because when I read A.W. Tozer's books or I listen to the Reverend Billy Graham, they still talk about these things that were happening in the 50s. It's just coming to, it's just coming to a point. It's coming to a head now. It's amazing reading and listening to their sermons from the 1950s and you're thinking, holy smokes, man. You know, they sat and told us that everything was going to happen, right? There was a book that told us everything was going to happen. But yet we still put off things like, I'll be ready when it's time to be ready. No. So we, we look at those things and we, 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 we think about where we're headed. So we need to discern between what? Good and evil. Not, be, not whether or not I should lie to Stephen. That should be common sense to me, shouldn't it? I mean, my father told me not to lie, Steve. But I need to discern good and evil. We went to Gatlinburg, and I'm not saying Gatlinburg's an evil city, okay? So don't say, Pastor Fred said that we need to go up there and cast out the demons, which we probably do, though. Let's just say that, too, right? So we're walking around, and, and you ever, like, get the sense that you're not supposed to be somewhere? Like, where you're at, it's like, I'm not, I don't need to be here. And, you know, forgive me, but I just don't like being around whiskey. I don't like being around alcohol. I don't be, or like being around places that promote marijuana and things like that. I just don't want to be around it. If the Lord puts me there to go talk to somebody, I'll go. But I'm only going with, with Stephen. Because he tells me to go in what? Twos. Twos. Because if I fall and no one's there to pick me up, then I'm going to fall by myself. I know what my temptations are. And, and if I go with Stephen, Stephen's going to slap me on the back of my head and say, hey, hey, man, you ain't supposed to go in there. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you keeping me out of that. Right? That pain might hurt a little bit, but that pain's going to hurt a whole lot less than that other pain that's going to come in my future. So we're walking around this place, and, and Jessica's just like, we're feeling miserable. Because it's this, and it's that, and it's this, and then here it is. Pastor Jerry said it earlier. Let me sprinkle a little bit of Jesus over here just so we feel good about what we're doing, right? Yeah. So that's where I started getting the shirts that says, all I need is whiskey and Jesus. So as long as I say the name Jesus, Pastor Sean, it's okay, right? I can go fornicate, I can drink, I can you know, act like a fool, I can do all these things, I can rip my shirts off and I can run through and do all these things, but as long as I say, or I have a t-shirt that says I'm revival, or I have a t-shirt that says uh, John 3.16, or if I or 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 you know put whatever you want on it, then it's okay, right? No. No, it's not okay. That's taking a selfie. That's putting yourself over Jesus. That's just sprinkling in a little bit of truth. When we were in Subway, there was this kid, and as soon as I looked at him, his eyes went down on the ground, and I thought, well, what, what's wrong with him? What did I do to him? I didn't. So I said, all right, well, I have that face sometimes that just makes people mad, you know. Sorry, I got this face from my father. <laughs> but I really try to smile 
<laughs> because I don't want people to get the wrong idea, you know? They're like, Pastor Fred, are you mad at me? No! I just look this way. I'm sorry, right? You should have saw me when I had short haircut and I had to walk out on the, on, on the thing and talk to Marines. They really thought I was going to kill them, right? Sometimes I was just thinking about stuff. Sometimes I wasn't even thinking. Believe it or not, ladies, sometimes men don't think. We just sit there. What are you thinking about? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Nothing, <laughs> right? So this kid, he put his eyes down, and I thought, well, all right. Maybe I made him mad. I don't know. Let me just finish my sandwich. You know, and Jessica's doing her sandwich because we're poor. We, we went to Gatlinburg and ate at Subway. Uh, so we're eating our sandwich. We're walking out, and Jessica said, did you, did you notice that kid? And I said, no, not really. I didn't notice anything about him. She said, did you notice his uh, upside-down cross and all of his other stuff? And I said, no, I didn't. I really didn't. And I started thinking, did he sense the Holy Spirit and put his eyes down? How in the world could you serve a God that you live in fear as soon as you encounter the Holy Spirit? So then Jessica got back to the car and she said, Lord, show me right now. Open my spiritual eyes over this place. And when you pray a prayer like that, you're kind of like, oh, I don't even know what I'm going to see. But discerning where we're at. Being sensitive to the Holy Spirit that where you're at, you may need to leave immediately and get out of there. Jessica told me one time when she was a kid, she went to a party one time, and there was a warlock at this party. And as soon as she walked in, he became angry with them. And he hated them. And he didn't want to be around them. Matter of fact, he was telling everybody else at this party that my wife and her friend needed to leave now. And every time my wife and her got closer to where this guy was, they were feeling this uneasiness about him. And then later on, a couple days later, they found out that there was an actual warlock at that party. He was in fear because he felt the Holy Spirit. That's the power that lives inside you if you choose to tap into that power. Yeah. Nothing can defeat you as long as that power is living inside you and you're living in him and he's living in you. Right. He never leaves right. me nor forsakes me or abandons me or tasks me out. He never says, I am so sick of you. Get out of here. Even when I run away, he, he grabs me by the back of my hoodie. Come here. I love Caden. He gets beat up by every single pastor in this church. <clears throat> Next slide. Listen, I don't need to add anything to my relationship with Jesus right. other than you. Because he tells me it's not good to be alone. But we need to start protecting our inner circles. We need to start paying attention to who's coming into our inner circle. We need to discern who we're around. I was talking to Brother Richard one day, and we were talking about something and about the wolves, and he said, how do we know the wolves aren't already here? I never forgot that, Richard. Always be vigilant. Always asking for the, always, always talking to uh, the Spirit and asking Him, help me, guide me. I can't see these things with my natural eyes. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end real close here today, right? Uh, Psalms 119, 1 through 3 has been on my heart since June 11th of this year. June 11th, I was in Hawaii, uh, and there were some things going on, and I, I couldn't sleep. And I just, when you can't sleep, what do you do? You pray, right? You get up, you start praying, start reading the word of God, start, Lord, help me, help me. And I really felt like I was just, he was dealing with me. You know, I, I think I talked to a couple of the elders there. I said, when I was in Hawaii, I just felt like I was back behind the woodshed and he was just beating the fire out of me, man. Just really laying some things on me about some stuff that I needed to get rid of. And this verse stuck to me and it's been in my book written down ever since. It says, joyful are people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Integrity, follow instructions of who? The Lord. the Lord. Joyful are those who obey in his laws and search for him with all their what? Their hearts. Everything they got. For they do not compromise with what? And they only walk in the path that he, 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 he lays for me. Do not compromise with evil. And only walk where I tell you to walk. Just like this morning when I was watching the Pil uh, Pilgrim's Progress and he was talking about these two guys that went off on their own path. What did the Pilgrim do? He stayed the path. He 
Ephesians 5 and 11, it says, Take no part in worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. Do not compromise and expose them. Do not compromise and expose them. Stop with a rinse and repeat, and let's drink from living water. Don't just come here to feel good. Come here to be equipped. This church is open seven days a week, I think. There's Bible study after discipleship after discipleship. Ever since 2011, when I, uh, 2012, when I first got here, Pastor Jerry, I think you got here in 2010, right? This man has been discipling us and over here uh, all the time. Now you have discipleship group here, you have discipleship group here, you have the school of ministry here, you have Impact Christian Academy over here where these young teenagers are growing further than some of us have sat in these pews for 80 years. It's time to stand up. And it's time to ask yourself, what's more important? Self or the Lord Jesus Christ? Do I truly believe in what he's done for me? Do I believe I need a shepherd and not just a savior? Listen, I want you to think about it today. Where are you at? What's between you and God? The booth's going to play a song real quick because I've asked Pastor Sean. I said, "I I think we need everybody to focus on these things. Listen, I'm not beyond any of the stuff that I talked about today. If you think for one second I wasn't on my knees every single day this week crying out to him, repenting, asking my wife, come in my office, pray for me, Jessica. Jessica, pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me, babe. There was days when I was walking back and forth in my house and I was feeling like garbage, but who was doing that? The enemy. The Lord was showing things to me. I just needed to lay it down. I needed to quit being stubborn and just lay it down. Quit accepting that that's just the way it is. I hate this saying. I hate this saying. It is what it is. Anytime I hear that, just neurons start firing in my head. I go back to the days of training, and I just want to reach out, grab somebody, and just choke slam them on the ground. But I know at 47, it's a little harder to do that, some of these young studs, right? So I make Pastor Sean do all that, right? But it's really time. So as this song plays, this is what I want you to think about. Am I ready? What else do I need to lay down? Where am I today? Listen, I don't need you to worry about what Jessica thinks, Richard. Jessica, I don't need you to worry about what Richard thinks. Girls, don't worry about what Pastor Sean thinks. Brad, don't worry about what I think. You don't need it anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Patty, don't, don't worry about what your brother thinks. I know you don't anyway. But ask yourself, Stephen, where are you? Jay? Tim? Kay? Where are you?
We don't have to live in fear. We don't have to continue to live in where we're living. Because at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, it's only one person that you're going to be accountable for, and that's you. And I can't blame that on anyone else. I can't stand before Jesus. I can't stand before judgment and say, well, the reason why I'm not the way I was supposed to be, Lord, is because you gave me that woman. Or you did this, or you gave me that. I can't do that. It has to be a total transformation from here. And we've said it many, many times in Luke 9.23. Deny yourself. Which means, it's no longer that I live, but Christ lives in me. Pick up my cross. Which means, put others before myself. And go help them. Stop worrying about what my schedule looks like and start asking the Lord what does my schedule need to be I know I need to get things done during the day but while I'm out there Lord you point me where I need to go and then follow him and that's probably the hardest one sometimes because if we take our eyes off Christ long enough we'll start to believe in that we're really that good and like my dad used to tell me all the time when I was growing up, and I'd come to him and I'd tell him, hey, Dad, look at this and look at that. He'd say, son, don't believe your own press clippings because you're not that good. And my father did that not because he didn't love us, because he wanted us to remain humble. He wanted us to be coachable, and he wanted us to be humble. And that's the same thing that I told my sons when they were, when they were growing up. You don't have to go off to all these stuff to become great. You just have to be humble have to be humble. And that's really it. Come to the kingdom in childlike faith. I really am closing. <laughs> but I think about that a lot when Elena or David jumps into my arms. They're not worrying about fall, falling. Because when I say, Elena, jump to Papa, what does she do? Jumps without question. David, I don't even have to say jump. That boy just jumps without warning. Just jumps. And I just... Because they know that Papa is going to do every single thing within my power to make sure that nothing happens to them. The same way when Dakota and Zachary were little boys and uh, they would talk about someone coming and taking them. You know, because you know, when you're a kid, you always think someone's going to come kidnap you. And I was gone a lot. You know, I was deployed or I was somewhere. But I remember coming home and I looked at Dakota in the face and I said, boy, you know what's going to happen if someone takes you? And he'd say, what, Daddy? And he'd start laughing. I'd say, I'm going to get my cami paint on. And I'm going to throw my ghillie suit on. And I'm going to grab my M16. And I'm going to go find them. And I'm going to bring you home. And he'd start laughing. And we'd laugh together. Because he knew without a shadow of a doubt that his father was going to seek him and go after him no matter where he was. Well, that's on my own strength. Just imagine what God's doing for you every single day. We just need to continue to lay ourselves down and, and look at one another. Sorry, Tim. And look at one another and ask ourselves, it's time to be serious. It's time to stop playing. Israel's at war. If you don't know what that means, come to me later. We'll talk about it. Israel's at war. Dad called us this week, my wife's father, and made a point to point out things to us. Son, Israel's at war. Because he wants the family to be what? Ready. When we left Hawaii, he said, Son, will you pray over the family? Anytime my father asked me to pray over the family, that's an honor because he's the head of the family, isn't he? I'm the head of my family, but he's the head of the whole family. I recognize his authority when we're all together. And when he laid it down and let me pray, I was honored. But as I was praying, I prayed for strength because I, never, I didn't know that we were ever going to be together again. Because I didn't know what kind of trials and tribulations were going to come upon us because we're in California, Oklahoma, Kentucky, Tennessee, Hawaii. We're all over the place. But I just prayed for strength that the Holy Spirit was going to guide us into the right direction. 
And that's what I pray over all of us right now. I'm serious about what we do. The elders love you. We pray for you. And we want the best for you. We're not worried about that time, even though that clock's staring me in the face. I'm more concerned about where we are. The gates of hell prevail where we fail. I want you to think about this week as we're going into first church coming up. Think about that verse. Think about what we're supposed to be doing. We can't sit here and say, well, it's because of this and this. What did Bethesda do? What did you do this week before the kingdom? All right. I've kept you long enough, right? Hey, I love you. If I don't tell you that enough, Dale, I love you. You know that, right? Okay. Andrew, you're not selfish. I love you. Right? I love each and every single one of you. Stephen, I love you, man. I do. And I'm telling you right now, when I tell you I love you, I'm not saying like, I love you, bro. That ain't me. If you don't know me by now, I don't know what to tell you. When I tell you I love you, it's because I love you. When I get in your face and I ask you a question, it's because I care about you. If I didn't care about you and I didn't love you, guess what I'd do, Caden? Do your own thing, dog. That's what I tell you. Whatever. I love you. I care about you. I care about where you're at. I pray for you as often as I do, as often as this memory brings your name to it, right? And if not, I always ask Brad what your name was, right? So let's close it out. Father God, we come to you right now, Lord Jesus, and we are just so, so thankful for being in your presence today. Lord, I pray over every single one of us right now that as we walk this week, that you show us what we need to continuously lay down, Lord. Make it uncomfortable for us. Grow us, Lord. Prepare us. Lord, make us ready. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys.